Shovel Knight has classic 8-bit gaming ideals, adopting gaming tropes from greats like Mega Man, Castlevania, and Mario. The thing is, many 8-bit inspired games seem to do this. They seem to pay a certain respect to the giants of the industry that came before them. But fairly often, retro inspired games tend not to stand on the shoulders of giants as much as they tend to stand at their feet, clearly looking up to them and rarely developing into something greater than what has come before. Shovel Knight, on the other hand, is different. It somehow manages to tug on nostalgic heartstrings, giving it a familiar feel, while simultaneously add enough of its own character and modern mechanics to feel fresh, original, and a whole lot of fun to play. The tale of Shovel Knight begins with a brief insight into the blue-clad warrior's past. You see, Shovel Knight was once accompanied by a faithful companion, Shield Knight, and together they knew many riches. But in a turn of fortune, during an expedition into the Tower of Fate, the two were separated, and the tower was sealed forever with Shield Knight inside. Afterward, the heartbroken Shovel Knight went into a life of solitude, and the absence of this duo allowed the evil Enchantress and her knights known as the Order of No Quarter to take over the land. But, after some time has passed, word has come that the Tower of Fate is open once again, and Shovel Knight sets out for the tower. The Order of No Quarter now occupies the territory that stands between Shovel Knight and the Tower of Fate. To reach the Tower of Fate, you'll battle across the land on an overworld map heavily reminiscent of 2D Mario games. The world map has side tasks, optional encounters, treasure troves, a few towns, and enemy castles. After entering a castle and reclaiming the territory by defeating the boss of the castle, the world map will open up to reveal more stages to overcome and charming people to meet. The world and aesthetic of Shovel Knight definitely has a certain life about itself. The music is upbeat, the town people have a spring in their step and a certain charm about them. From a child pushing a hoop with a stick to a barroom ball or a dancing fish king, it's always a pleasure to see what lively or cheerful encounter is awaiting you by speaking to the people of the world. The townspeople also play a large role in equipping and upgrading Shovel Knight. There's a weapon and armor smith with a handful of modifications available as well as a cook and an alchemist. Purchasing meal tickets to give to the cook will increase Shovel Knight's health, whereas spending your hard-earned treasure on the alchemist will increase your magic points. This is important because when you're not swinging your shovel, magic is used as fuel to power your relics. Relics are secondary items scattered throughout the world, which, once purchased from a merchant, are permanently added to your inventory. Each relic has a different ability, like a wand to shoot fireballs, a propeller to dash through the air, a phase shifter to walk on spikes, and a dozen others. Upgrading magic can be avoided entirely, but its usefulness through relics is hard to pass by, especially when entering the more difficult later game castles with tougher platforming sections. The platforming sections in each castle stage look fantastic, and the difficulty progression feels just right. Stages could see you traversing a pool of lava on the back of a giant beetle, or facing off against one of the many fast-paced, high-intensity boss encounters, among many other interactive platforming and stage mechanics that I won't spoil here. But let's just say that the stage diversity is good and plays with themes like fire, snow, and wind, and for the most part, the platforming itself is sharp and precise. The controls of Shovel Knight feel great. There was only a few occasions where I died and felt it wasn't my fault, requiring a second trip with the knowledge of what lie ahead in order to survive. Despite the seldom cheap deaths, Shovel Knight luckily handles death and checkpoints quite nicely. As mentioned earlier, treasure is used for many things from upgrading Shovel Knight to purchasing relics, so it's very important. While checkpoints can be destroyed for money, the catch is when Shovel Knight dies, he will lose a chunk of his treasure and be sent back to the closest remaining checkpoint but you have one chance to make it back to where he died to recover the lost treasure. The system creates a fantastic sense of risk versus reward when deciding what's more important. Is a sense of security more important, or is all that priceless treasure worth the risk? Regardless of how reckless you choose to play, the game has a great level design that encourages exploration, which also creates a strong allure to find secrets and unearthed treasure troves. I definitely enjoyed the 8 hours of gameplay it took me to uncover many of the mysteries begging to be dug up in Shovel Knight. It's one thing to call a game an instant classic, essentially implying the specific game in question will stand the test of time and live on to be known as a great title for many years to come. Well, Shovel Knight does feel like that, but it also feels like an instant classic in the sense that it could be easily mistaken for one of gaming's forefathers plucked straight from the NES generation. 
From platforming precision, sense of achievement, pacing, progression, and charm, Shovel Knight stands head and shoulders with the great games that inspired it. And most importantly, any fan of old school action platforming classics shouldn't miss out on Shovel Knight.